With the rash of high profile breakdowns in the sport, fingers are being pointed in every direction as we scramble to find someone, something, anything to blame for the recent tragedies. And there is certainly plenty of blame to go around. Training methods, track surface, drug usage, and of course, breeding. People are crying out that the breed is weaker it used to be, horses are bred for the sales ring instead of the racetrack, and that the commercial market rewards brilliance over durability. And while, you know, people have been complaining about the weakening of the breed for practically the entire history of the thoroughbred racehorse, I want to talk today about one word that pops up very frequently in this conversation of what's wrong with the way we breed racehorses, and that is inbreeding. Inbreeding is, of course, the mating of closely related organisms, and it's well documented that excessive inbreeding can lead to negative effects on a population known as inbreeding depression. Now, I usually differentiate between inbreeding and line breeding, which is inbreeding to distant ancestors, but for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to be using the term inbreeding to cover both. Heterosis, or hybrid vigor, which is an improvement in quality of hybrid offspring, is often considered the opposite of inbreeding depression, although it should be noted that not all outcrossing results in heterosis. Heterosis is the tendency of outbred strains to exceed both parents in what biologists refer to as fitness, the breadth of traits that affect reproduction and lifespan, such as fertility, resistance to disease, etc. Now, examples of hybrid vigor range from the increased yield of hybrid plants to the tendency of hybrid livestock to be larger, faster maturing, and or more fertile than their purebred parents. First, let's talk about the benefits of inbreeding, because if it was all bad, we wouldn't be having this conversation at all. Inbreeding simply wouldn't happen. In order to do this, we need a quick refresher in basic biology. So, living organisms are made up of cells. The instructions for cells are contained within an organism's DNA sequence. The total composition of genetic material within a cell, known as a genome, is packaged into units known as chromosomes. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, one copy of each set inherited from each parent. 22 paired chromosomes, known as autosomes, and two sex chromosomes, which determine the sex of the offspring. Horses, meanwhile, have 32 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome contains genes, the basic unit of heredity, through which parents pass traits on to their offspring. Each different variation of a gene is called an allele. The two copies inherited, one from each parent on half of a chromosome pair, then influence cell function. Alleles interact with one another in various ways known as inheritance patterns. For now, we're really just going to worry about autosomal dominant and recessive genes, genes that are inherited on a non-sex chromosome. An allele of a gene is said to be dominant when it overrides the other recessive allele. It only needs a single copy of an allele to be expressed, whereas both alleles in a gene pair need to be identical in order for a recessive trait to be expressed. For example, in horses, there are two basic coat colors, black and chestnut. All other color variations in the horse are based on the way that other genes interact with this base coat color gene. And in horses, black is dominant over chestnut. So let's take a look here at two horses. We've got a chestnut stallion and a black mare. So in this example, we're assuming that both have a homozygous genotype, meaning they have matching copies of the base coat color allele. All chestnuts are homozygous because chestnut is recessive and is always masked by black, as you can see here in the foal. This foal is heterozygous because it has two separate alleles, one for chestnut and one for black. While its phenotype or observable traits are identical to that of its dam, its genotype or its combination of alleles is different from its dam which we can see when breeding that foal back to a chestnut. So you might recognize this chart. It's known as a Punnett square, and it shows the probability of offspring from a mating inheriting a certain genotype. In this case, when we breed our heterozygous black mare to a chestnut stallion, we have a 50% chance of the offspring being either chestnut or black, depending on which allele the foal inherits from the dam, since we know that it will inherit a chestnut allele from the stallion. Now, obviously, this is happening for tens of thousands of genes in every mating, and there are also genes that are co-dominant and they combine with their heterozygous. There's sex-linked genes that are inherited on sex chromosomes, and they can all interact and affect the expression of other genes. So this is a vastly oversimplified example, but you should understand a few key terms that we're going to be coming back to. So why is inbreeding so important in domestic animals? Inbreeding, especially in a tightly controlled population like that of the thoroughbred, is a way to promote favorable genes and decrease the frequency of unfavorable genes. It increases homozygosity in a population so that there's less variation in the offspring and results in a more uniform population, establishing a breed type where desired traits are consistently present in the breed phenotype. 
Inbreeding also increases predictability when it comes to breeding crosses. So if you know, for instance, that your horse is a sprinter who consistently produces sprinters, then that horse is likely homozygous for certain genes that might contribute to sprinting ability. If you breed that horse to a similar type of horse, you're likely to get another sprinter. This homozygosity can be seen in stallions that are known for being exceptionally prepotent, those that stamp their offspring with a distinctive look. For instance, Into Mischief is a stallion whose offspring often have a fairly distinctive physical type. You can really pick them out of a crowd with ease. This suggests that Into Mischief is homozygous for some of the genes that contribute to the typical phenotype of his offspring. An example, going back to our coat color lesson from a minute ago, would be Triple Crown winner Seattle Slough who was homozygous for the black coat color, which we know because he never had any chestnut offspring, just black, bay, and gray. So in this way, inbreeding can also eliminate issues in a breed by removing the deleterious allele from the genome of the breeding population. So inbreeding allows us to fix certain characteristics in a breed, which increases predictability and decreases the variability of mating outcomes to create a more desirable animal. So now that we have looked at the positives, let's take a look at the negative side of inbreeding. The main problem with increasing homozygosity of a breed is that while you are fixing the desired genes, you're also increasing the homozygosity of deleterious recessive genes that could lead to infirmities, sterility, other issues. And genes that you're not actively selecting for are still being passed on, even if it's not the focus of your breeding program. So while breeding two horses with similar genomes could increase the odds of getting a foal with favorable traits, it could also increase the odds of the foal receiving unfavorable recessive genes that were heterozygous in the parents, but are now being expressed in their homozygous form in the foal. So there are two competing theories for why this happens. The overdominance hypothesis states that genetic variance for fitness is caused by genes where heterozygotes are going to be more fit than either version of the homozygote. Since inbreeding decreases the frequency of heterozygotes and increases homozygosity, fitness is thus reduced. The dominance hypothesis, on the other hand, states that genetic variance for fitness is caused by rare deleterious alleles that are recessive or partly recessive. Since inbreeding increases the frequency of organisms that are homozygous for these deleterious alleles, fitness is reduced. So here is a very basic simplified example of inbreeding depression. Let's say we have gene A and the Dominant form, the uppercase A, is your, your normal horse, whereas the lowercase A, which I've put in red to make things easier, is the recessive form of the gene. And we're going to say that when this recessive gene is expressed, it causes something bad. Uh, let's say increased breakdowns in the horses. So here we have two horses. One of them is heterozygous for this gene A, and one is homozygous for the normal dominant version of A. If we breed these two horses, let's say we breed them three times. We have one who inherited two dominant copies of the allele. And then we have two that ended up with the recessive allele from one of the parents. Now let's say in an extreme example of inbreeding, we were to breed these two siblings who are both heterozygous for our deleterious allele. And now suddenly we have a 25% chance that their foal is going to inherit both recessive copies and then express the problematic effect. However, if we were to breed one of these heterozygotes to a horse who is homozygous for the dominant version of this gene, then we have no chance of the horse inheriting two copies of the recessive gene. And we have a much greater chance of breeding another horse who is homozygous for the dominant and preferable version of this gene. So this is, that's obviously way stupidly oversimplified, but that's the gist of why inbreeding is bad. For a real life example, there is a 2005 study of the heritability of tying up in thoroughbreds that found moderate correlations between an increased inbreeding coefficient, which is basically the percent chance that a horse is going to inherit the same allele from both parents and the prevalence of tying up syndrome. So now note that this doesn't mean that inbreeding causes tying up. It means that horses who are inbred are more likely to receive the gene or genes responsible for a horse being predisposed to tying up. Another issue that inbreeding creates is it sort of puts a ceiling on breed improvement. At a certain point, you have your fixed type for the breed and there's really no novel way for genes to combine to create something better than what's come before. 
for example, you can take a look here. There was a drastic decrease in winning times for high level races going back to the 19th century and the start of races such as the Triple Crown. But winning times for these elite races have largely plateaued over the last 50 years or so. Now, there are studies also showing, though, that this is not true of sprint races, where winning times have actually been improving fairly rapidly compared to middle and long distance races. That study also showed that the average time for all races across the breed have been improving slowly but steadily since 1997, suggesting that perhaps there's a shrinking talent gap between the elite and mediocre race winners. So whether the thoroughbred has reached its peak of performance is tough to say for certain, but it certainly seems possible that we're getting close to the physical limit of how fast a horse can run. So that brings up the question, how inbred is the modern thoroughbred really? As many of you probably know, the thoroughbred originally descended from three foundation stallions, the Godolphin Arabian, the Darley Arabian, and the Byerly Turk, each of whom had one primary sire descendant through which their line continued. Today, the line of the Byerly Turk is essentially extinct worldwide, and the Godolphin Arabian's line is in serious trouble, where Tisnow was really the last prominent source of the line in North America. As of 2001, 95% of modern thoroughbreds trace their paternal lineage to the Darley Arabian via Eclipse. And the stallion Falaris, who was born in 1913, is the tail male ancestor of basically every major sire line in existence today. So when people talk about Northern Dancer, Mr. Prospector, Nazrula, Buck Passer, Turn 2, it doesn't matter. All of those sire lines are still Falaris. So clearly there is a lack of genetic diversity when it comes to sire lines, but things aren't really all that much better on the female side of the coin. There were approximately 70 foundation mares that have been identified in the thoroughbred going back to the origins of the breed. There are 41 different foundation mares represented among 223 Hall of Fame racehorses in North America. And according to a 2012 study, there are only 33 major maternal lineages in the modern thoroughbred. Among the 296 thoroughbred horses studied from these major lines, the study found that there were just 25 unique mitochondrial haplotypes or genetically unique maternal lineages. And the gene pool is still contracting. Taking a look at the report of mares bred, which is a report of how many mares each stallion bred in a season, we see that in 1997, there were 5,126 unique stallions who covered over 60,000 mares. So that is a mare to stallion ratio of 11.8 mares per stallion. In 2020, there were 1,449 unique stallions covering just under 30,000 mares for a mare to stallion ratio of 20.5. And in 1997, there were only 32 stallions who covered 100 or more mares led by Woodman with 174. These top 32 stallions covered 6.2% of the total mares bred. In 2020, there were 90 stallions who covered 100 plus mares, led by Uncle Mo with 262. The top 32 stallions covered over 20% of the mares bred. And there's little hope of changing this trend of fewer stallions with larger books getting a larger share of a shrinking pool of mares. When the Jockey Club tried to put into effect a mare cap of 140 mares per stallion per season, they were sued by major stud farms who claimed that the rule threatened to disrupt the free market nature of the bloodstock business and constituted a blatant abuse of power. The Jockey Club moved to dismiss the lawsuit, but before the judge could make a ruling, a bill was filed in Kentucky to essentially prohibit the number of mares bred to a stallion from being restricted, and the rule was subsequently rescinded. So those hoping to increase diversity in the breed by, say, spreading out the number of mares each stallion gets are going to need another strategy because the mare cap is not going to fly. So what other options do we have? If we want to reduce inbreeding in the thoroughbred, what if we just introduce blood from non-thoroughbreds to increase heterozygosity in the breed? Well, it's not that simple. Uh, the thoroughbred has no, what's known as a closed stud book. The horse cannot be registered as a thoroughbred unless both parents were registered thoroughbreds. Additionally, breeding a hybrid does not automatically mean you're going to get a better animal because just as there's inbreeding depression, there's also outbreeding depression, which is what happens when crosses between two genetically distinct populations result in a reduction of fitness. 
thoroughbred breeders already refer to this when they talk about breeding like to like in terms of body type. So for instance, if you have a small stocky but bulky dirt sprinter and you're breeding that horse to a rangy fine boned turf router, what do you think is more likely? That you're going to get the perfect alignment of genes in every case that you're going to end up with a horse who, you know, maybe a middle distance horse who can do both dirt and turf? Or is it more likely that you're going to end up with a horse with short legs but a long body or a horse with the the speed of a router but the stamina of a sprinter a horse who basically can't do either this is an issue for breeders who want to stay away from inbreeding in the modern thoroughbred a lot of the outcrosses even within the breed just aren't really genetically compatible with a majority of breeding stock a relatively recent example of this would be the stallion einstein He's a Brazilian bred grade one winner at four, six, and seven. And he's the kind of horse that in a perfect world could introduce soundness to the breed via unique bloodlines. He was by spend a buck. He had just one cross of Northern Dancer back in his fourth generation and was completely free of Mr. Prospector. He retired to Adina Springs in Kentucky for a $7,500 fee in 2010, where he was not really all that well received by the commercial market. But the interesting thing is that his first crop had an average nine generation coefficient of inbreeding of 1.26%, which is pretty low by modern standards. And frankly, they just really weren't that great on the racetrack. In his career, he got just three stakes winners and sired a pretty average 64.6% .6 winners in general with an average earnings index of 0.61. In other words, his offspring typically earned 61% of what the average horse did in the years they raced. So it's really not surprising that he was pensioned in 2018. Now you could argue, Jess, that Einstein wasn't very commercially appealing. He didn't get the best mares. He really didn't have an opportunity to excel. And you'd absolutely have great points. There's never a single reason for a failed stud career. And I could make a whole video about the commercial market and the ways it kind of works against the breed as a whole. But it's still reasonable to think that there's quite a possibility that Einstein's progeny might have just been too heterozygous to really thrive as resources. So is the thoroughbred exceptionally inbred? Yes. There's very little genetic diversity in thoroughbred in the context of modern horse breeds. A 2012 study of the thoroughbred population in Hungary showed that the average inbreeding coefficient for the breed to be 9.58%. And generally it's understood that the negative effects of inbreeding begin to occur around the 5% mark and 10% is kind of considered the, the point of no return when it comes to inbreeding depression. However, is inbreeding a new phenomenon in the breed? No, not at all. While the breed is becoming more inbred in one sense as the allele variations present in the population are coming from an increasingly shrinking number of sources, on the other hand, close inbreeding seems to actually be much less fashionable than it was in the past. You can see here the nine generation coefficient of inbreeding for all Hall of Fame racehorses sorted by their first year racing. And it really seems to show a trend toward the elite horses, at least of the modern era, being slightly less closely inbred than the elite horses of the past. And clearly, this is only taking into account the first nine generations and horses who have ancestors duplicated in both the sire and dam within that period. However, it certainly seems that the general trend is toward lower inbreeding coefficients compared to very early horses such as Lexington and Kentucky and Preakness. However, it does, you might note that it looks like the 21st century might be trending slightly back toward higher inbreeding coefficients than those of the late 20th century, but this is from a very small data size, so it's hard to really draw any conclusions for certain. It's just kind of a quick illustration uh, that inbreeding isn't some new thing that breeders are doing that they didn't do before. Now, the other question is, does this inbreeding contribute to breakdowns? And that's really not so cut and dry. Studies have shown that overall, the more inbred a horse, the less likely it is to race. A 2022 study on inbreeding depression and the probability of racing in the thoroughbred horse suggested that while more recently shared common ancestors have a negative effect on the viability of a horse for racing, distant inbreeding actually has a positive association with racing performance. Looking at the nine generation coefficient of inbreeding in the 206 horses who have died as a result of training or racing injuries in 2023, compared to a control sample of 200 retired horses, 
showed that the breakdown sample was actually slightly less inbred than the controlled group with an average of 2.11% in the sample that had suffered breakdowns versus 2.43% in the pseudo random control group of retired racehorses. Obviously, these are fairly small sample sizes and a lot more research needs to be done on that front, but it's hard to claim based on look this that inbreeding as a rule is to blame for breakdowns. While certain deleterious genes becoming homozygous in the population is obviously problematic, it's still beneficial to racing performance to ensure that beneficial genes are duplicated in the pedigree and therefore more likely to express themselves in a racehorse. Various studies have actually pinpointed genes that seem like likely suspects to contribute to negative effects, such as genes involved in bone and tissue repair, but there is still a lot of study to be done on that front. So in my opinion, the problem with the way racehorses are bred isn't inbreeding per se. Inbreeding by increasing the homozygosity of a breed can fix desirable traits that improve health and performance. Particularly, evidence suggests that inbreeding in the distant pedigree is often beneficial, especially to ancestors who themselves were inbred. Now, why is this? Well, horses who themselves were inbred and suffered no ill effects are likely homozygous for beneficial genes, but not deleterious ones. Additionally, we have to remember that inbreeding only matters when both parents share an ancestor, because inbreeding is all about the odds of a horse inheriting the same allele from both parents. Breeding a highly inbred horse is not a, you're not going to have an inbred foal necessarily. If you have a horse who's three by three to Mr. Prospector, and you breed that horse to a, another horse who doesn't have Mr. Prospector, the foal is not inbred. So that is something that's worth keeping in mind here in this conversation. There's also evidence showing that inbreeding two organisms who are themselves inbred to different ancestors actually has beneficial effects on the population and is more likely to lead to heterosis than breeding two outbred organisms. So if inbreeding isn't the problem with the way horses are bred, what is? To me, the problem really is that horses with a genetic predisposition to injury are being bred with other horses who only increase the likelihood of their foals inheriting a combination of genes that contributes to their risk of catastrophic injury. I don't necessarily think that just because a horse suffered a fracture that that should be an automatic disqualification for a horse to enter the gene pool. It, I mean, it would certainly probably increase soundness in the breed, but it's simply just not feasible or reasonable to expect breeders to do that. And it could even lead to generations of decreased performance as plenty of the factors that make a fast horse are often seen in combination with factors that make a fragile horse. So I don't think that a horse who, you know, retired early necessarily needs to be culled from the breeding population. However, I do think that breeders need to be very conscious of their horse's likelihood of carrying these genes that lead to injury or unsoundness and be wary of breeding to the ancestors that are suspected to have been the source of these negative traits. So one example of a horse that comes up all the time in this conversation is Unbridled Song. As an interesting little side note, Unbridled Song's coefficient of inbreeding is just 0.77%. You can compare that to a horse like Include, who has over 80% starters and an average of over 19 starts per starter. His coefficient of inbreeding, 3.62%. So clearly, in this very cherry-picked example, inbreeding, having an inbred horse, is, does not mean you're going to get unsound foals from that horse. But nevertheless, people often claim unbridled song is a source of fragility, and there is definitely some reasonable, there's reasons to believe that. Should we just cut, cut him from the gene pool? Just anybody who has unbridled song just should not be bred. I think that's going too far. Aside from simply being unreasonable to expect of industry shareholders, it's simply not necessary, I think. It's not as if every unbridled song suffers a catastrophic injury, and there are clearly desirable genes being passed on, or it wouldn't be such a potent influence. Instead, I think that breeders just need to be more selective when breeding descendants of horses with a history of injury, even when the immediate parent appears to be sound, in order to decrease the likelihood of negative recessive traits becoming homozygous. For instance, a article actually came out just this morning on Pollock Report about how the intimitative ghost sapper cross has been very popular in book one of the Keeneland September sale. And while this cross, it, there's no inbreeding in the first five generations uh, when you breed a intimitative to a ghost sapper mare, but to me, this is the kind of cross we should be avoiding. 
aside from the fact that it hasn't actually produced a stakes winner in nine starters, which fair, it is a small sample size. It can and probably will happen. But both of these horses dealt with injuries in their career. Into Mischief started only six times in his two and three-year-old season, and Go Sepper raced only 11 times from ages two to five. So this, to me, is a much bigger problem than inbreeding. If you're inbreeding to the right horses, you could inbreed for soundness, in theory. And inbreeding by itself is not the problem with the thoroughbred. The problem with the thoroughbred is the thoroughbred and the horses that we're choosing to breed and we're choosing to reinforce these sorts of infirmities in the breed. For instance, I would always advise, as far as an inbreeding perspective, I would always advise against inbreeding to unbridled song. Not only is it not productive, there's been only a single stakes winner in over 80 starters, but you're kind of just asking for trouble by breeding two horses who are carrying the genes of a horse who is a notorious example that the industry likes to throw out of a horse who caused problems in his offspring when it came to durability and soundness. So in conclusion, inbreeding is a valuable tool for breeders to increase the consistency and the quality of their stock, but it needs to be done mindfully. Breeders should be careful of inbreeding to unsound horses and just be careful of breeding in unsound horses to each other in general in order to minimize the risk of genetic factors that could predispose a horse to injury. Hopefully the future will see genetic tests for these factors as research continues to be expanded upon, but for now our best tool is the pedigree page and having as much knowledge as possible about the horses that we're allowing to contribute to the gene pool. And overall, I think that there are a lot more pressing issues when it comes to the fragility of the breed than inbreeding or the breeding shed in general. But I do think that this is a topic that deserves some exploration and deserves some conversation around it. So I wanted to kind of jumpstart that and give my two cents. So let me know in the comments below what you think. Is, is inbreeding a big issue in the industry? Is the breeding side of things to blame for the unsoundness of the breed? Or are there other factors that need to be more carefully considered or that time and energy should be focused on? Let me know and let me know if you liked this style of educational informative video. It's a little bit different from what I normally do. So uh, I put a lot of time into it. So I'd appreciate you letting me know what you think, whether you like it or you hate it. Let me know, uh, give this a like, make sure to subscribe for all the great stuff we're doing on Trust the Profits and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Thank you.